Hey everyone, we're going to get right into the scary stories, don't worry, but I did just want to remind you all that this upload is a collection episode for all brand new subscribers and listeners of this channel. It contains re-recorded versions of all the true scary Valentine's Day stories that we've covered here in the past. But don't worry though, as we'll be back to all brand new stories on the next episode. So, if you're a new listener, or an OG subscriber looking to hear these stories again in one big video, this one is for you. So sit back, relax, and enjoy. I don't know why this had to happen to me. Seriously. One day, everything is fine, and the next thing I know, I'm dealing with a secret stalker. What I'm talking about was around 2010 and before Valentine's Day. Out of the blue, I received a message on my Facebook. Curious to see who was bugging me, I went ahead and opened it, and I was met with a surprise. Do you love me? I clicked on the profile just to see who it was, and it was completely empty. No friends barely any sort of description, only a single post that said, I love Haley, with a picture of me from my yearbook for senior year. I should have just ignored the message, but I wanted to know if it was some sort of joke. Okay, who is this and what do you want from me? The person responded almost immediately, I'm your secret admirer, don't you remember who I am? There is a back and forth conversation as I try to get more details. Eventually, I'm able to determine that whoever this was, wasn't going to budge. Could I visit you tomorrow? I've got some gifts I'd like to give you. Seriously, who is this? You don't even know where I live. This stranger responded five minutes later with complete details. My address, full name, and, to top it off, a picture of my house. Well, at least from what I was able to tell, the image was dark most likely because it was taken in the evening, so I went ahead and downloaded the picture out of curiosity and I turned the brightness up. I was shocked to find out that it was my house. It had the same Christmas lights that we had been too lazy to take down. As I was adjusting the image, I received another one. This one was a bit more clear. It appeared to be taken outside my bedroom window, and the image was me sitting on my bed, painting my nails. Okay, now this was really starting to get creepy. So I went ahead and called my closest friends, but they all claimed that none of them would go as far to sneak around my home and take pictures in the night. I was now left helpless. Who was I supposed to tell? My mom and my dad? I mean, what were they going to do? Tell this person to knock it off? After all, if they knew where I lived, along with my personal information, what's stopping them from visiting? This left me with only one other option, tell my parents regardless. To my surprise, they actually did believe me. We went down to the local police department to present my evidence. They told my parents and I that there wasn't really much they could do, but did offer to patrol my neighborhood more frequently. I guess this was still back in the day when things like this weren't very common. Disappointed, we start to make our way out the door. However, before leaving, one of the officers I talked to walked over to us and handed over his personal number. He told us that if we saw any suspicious activity or persons, we were to call him. Fast forward a few months later, Valentine's Day had come and gone, and there was no sign of this mysterious Facebook account showing up to my home. No longer were they bugging me with information or pictures. I was starting to think that this was a prank from one of my friends and my stress levels started to relax, though looking back I should have still been on high alert. One evening I was home alone with my dachshund and we had been laying in my bed watching a movie. Out of nowhere, my dog jumps off the bed and heads into the living room where she started to bark like crazy. Seeing as I was alone, I genuinely got freaked out, so I ended up grabbing the only sort of self-defense tool I could find near me, which was a broom, and I start to make my way toward my dog. This was when I was able to hear the front door handle being messed with. I knew it wasn't my parents returning, as my dog never barks at them. Plus, they had just left. No way they were returning that fast. With my adrenaline pumping and heart racing, I am suddenly driven into panic when the doorbell rings. I am then able to catch the faint noise of footsteps running off my front porch. That was it for me. 
So I called the police officer who had given me his number and he told me he would head over right now. In the meantime, he told me to call the local police department as well. I do, and I grab my dog and lock ourselves in my bedroom. As I waited, trying to calm myself from fainting of pure fear, I stayed on the line with my police officer friend. He showed up before the police department, and he said it was safe to walk outside. I'm outside your house. Can you come open the door? I got up, but as I walk over to let him in, I hear his phone fall what sounds like a struggle ensues. I open the front door, and to my surprise, the officer is fighting with a masked man, and I can also see there's a large knife on the ground lying next to him. Stay back, lock the door, the officer instructed, as he tries to get a hold of this possible masked intruder. Less than a minute later, the police department arrives, and they're able to take control of the situation. I was left crying and in shock as my officer friend told me that this guy suddenly jumped at him with that knife. Anyway, long story short, I was questioned for the next 15 or so minutes. By the end of it, they told me they were going to keep in touch, but it wasn't until a few weeks later that I found out that the man who tried to break into my home that night was connected to that Facebook account. He ended up confessing to the whole thing, and 10 years later, I often think of that night, and I still wonder how in the world he had gotten my information. That's why if I can send a message to everyone listening, I tell you this. Please be careful with what you post. It's very easy for someone to find out where you live. Remember, this was back in 2010. You would really have to go out of your way to look somebody up. Nowadays, it's incredibly easy. When most people describe a creepy Valentine story, they usually will go on about a creepy ex-boyfriend, or a creepy ex-girlfriend, or even sometimes a creepy stalker. I'm not really sure where this one fits, because I surely don't know this person. Why don't I just go ahead and tell you about what happened? For just a quick reference, I'm female and 21 years old, and I work at a bakery where we make everything you can think of. Birthday and wedding cakes, cupcakes, cookies, brownies, chocolates, you name it. Over the course of two weeks, our business really picked up, those two weeks being right before Valentine's Day. It was usually orders for chocolate, and sometimes we had customers who requested that we make a boatload of cakes. I truly loved this time, because it was when I would get most of my hours. So the evening before Valentine's Day, it was just myself and another baker named Cody, and we were 20 or so minutes from closing. While I was organizing some of the displays, I ended up hearing the front door opening. I turned my attention to the customer who entered and I advised them that we would be closing soon. He completely ignored me, however, and he started to act really suspiciously. I don't know, but not replying to a friendly hello is one thing. Constantly keeping his hands in his sweater was another. Let me explain. The way he had his hands in his sweater made it look like he had some sort of weapon. This was something I mentioned to Cody, and we both just sort of laughed. Well, let me know if you need any help, sir. I told this gentleman, who for the past two to three minutes was just walking around the store. Fast forward not too long after I talked to him, I was still talking with Cody. I had my back turned against the cash register, and Cody was in front of me. Suddenly, Cody goes quiet, and he points directly behind me. I turned around, and I was faced with a pistol. Hand over all the money you have in the cash register, the man said in a disgruntled voice. My face went pale, and I started to shake as he started to become more and more aggressive. I said, hand over all the money you guys have, or it's going to end badly. Cody and I do exactly as he said, handing over about $500 from the cash register. This wasn't enough. He now demanded to know if we had a safe we did, but too bad for him we didn't know the combination for the safe as only the owner knew it. In frustration, and I think because even he was starting to panic, he storms out of our bakery. Cody now hits the alarm and I go to secure the front door. By the time police officers had gotten there, the armed robber was nowhere in sight. Thankfully, however, we had caught him on CCTV cameras and officers were able to find and arrest him no more than a week later.
This story happened to both my friend and I. I have gone ahead and written it up on behalf of the both of us. My friend, who we will call Alexa, was performing at a coffee shop on Valentine's Day back in 2017. Now, for just some quick context, the coffee shop is in a medium-sized shopping center which is made up of various mom-and-pop shops. The only notable restaurant or store name you would find was the McDonald's. The shopping center was also right next to a park. Right behind that park are some woods. Anyway, I had arrived pretty early so that I was able to get a good spot. I knew this was going to be a full house, seeing as there were going to be many local artists performing. Sure enough, when I had pulled up into the shopping center, most of the spots had already been filled. Now let me tell you, they weren't all going to that McDonald's, although I'm sure they appreciated the extra customers that they must have received that evening and afternoon. Fast forward to after the show, I was hanging out with my friend, and some of the people who had watched my friend perform came to get pictures as well as autographs. It was really cool to think just a short year ago, Alexa was super shy. Getting her in front of any sort of crowd would have sent her into a panicked frenzy. How I was so proud to see her get the attention that she so rightfully deserved. At one point, we were starting to put some of her things in the back of her Volkswagen Beetle when we noticed a man walked over to both Alexa and I. I recognized him. He was there watching the show along with me, just a few seats over. He's about late 30s, around 5 foot 10. 230 to 250 pounds. He wore large sunglasses, a torn up white t-shirt, and jeans. His hair was long and messy, and he had a neatly trimmed goatee. I had wondered where he had went since he left almost immediately after my friend had gotten off the stage. These are for you. I thought you did an absolutely incredible job up there. By the way, sorry if this is so sudden, but do you have a boyfriend? If not, perhaps you'd like to go out and get some food. That was more or less what he said, and he was straight to the point. I'll give him that. But maybe it was because it was Valentine's Day and he thought, why not try his luck? He then hands over Alexa a bouquet of flowers. My friend was very flattered, and bless her heart, she is the sweetest person I know. She had to kindly tell him that she did have a boyfriend at the time, but did appreciate the flowers. Instantly, this man's friendly and kind nature switched to one of anger. Oh, so I guess that's how you treat your new fans, huh? Why is it every time I meet a pretty girl, they have a boyfriend? She apologized, and me being the overly protective friend that I am, I told him he needed to relax. He then rips the bouquet of roses out of my friend's hand, and then he pushes me. Why don't you stay out of this? Wait, you're the boyfriend? Huh, <laughs> nah, I highly doubt it. You don't seem man enough to be with someone like her. Honestly, I was this close to punching him right in the face. But instead, we walked back to the coffee shop as she began to cry. Some of the other people in attendance stared this creep down as he sort of just walked away. Now, that in itself was a bit creepy, but that's nothing compared to what would happen a short time later. Fast forward about an hour. We had gone to that same McDonald's that's in the shopping center to get a late night dinner. After we walked over to the park, as I tried to cheer my friend up with my comedy routine I was practicing, I was and still do comedy stand up alongside my main job by the way. Nonetheless, the park was pretty empty, and the only people we had seen were a couple that sat at the outskirts that were drinking some coffee with their two German shepherds lying next to them. They will play a part in this story, so don't forget that I mentioned them. My friend and I walked over to the woods because there is a pond that usually has ducks. It was late in the evening, but we were hoping we might be able to see some of the little ducklings that had hatched not too long ago. Spoiler alert, we found nothing. Disappointed, we started to make our way out of this wooded area, and that was when we were able to hear somebody whispering, along with footsteps. My friend and I are caught off guard moments later, as three men, armed with knives, come out from hiding. One of them was a familiar face. The guy from the coffee shop. Looks like he had backup. What happens next is they begin to form a circle of sorts as they try to block our way out. Fight or flight kicked in. There is no way I was about to take on three guys that are armed with knives. 
Both my friend and I book it, as these three then begin to chase us with purpose. This chase doesn't last too long, however, because we manage to get the attention of that couple from earlier with the German shepherds. However, by the time we reach them, the three creeps who had just chased us were nowhere to be seen. That's so weird. We saw them following you and we thought maybe they were just some friends playing around with you. One of them relayed to both Alexa and I. That would explain why we kept hearing footsteps, but any time we tried looking to see if we were being followed, there was no one. Anyway, that was pretty much the end of that creepy encounter. I know it was stupid we didn't tell the police, but karma wasn't going to let things settle. A few weeks later, I was watching the news and they were talking about a police chase that had happened a little while ago. They showed the man's picture, and to my absolute surprise, it was the same man from the performance that night on Valentine's Day. I took a picture of the TV and then I texted Alexa. Sure enough, she was also able to conclude that it was the same man. Now interesting, we never saw him around the city nor near that coffee shop since. As for the two accomplices, we don't really remember how they looked like, mainly because of the poor lighting in the park that night, so who knows whether or not they're still at large. Hey everyone, the Creepy Fox here. Really quickly before we continue, to those of you who are subscribed to the channel, just go ahead and make sure you look down below the video and just check to make sure you're subscribed. YouTube is doing that thing again where they're unsubscribing a lot of people for whatever dumb reason they're doing it for. So I just wanted to go ahead and remind you all since I know there's so many of you who look forward to these uploads and then YouTube unsubscribes you or they don't notify you. It's really weird. But yeah, anyway, let's go ahead and continue on with these scary stories. Happy Valentine's Day, something I read every single year when logging on to social media. Yes, happy Valentine's Day indeed. Happy to know that I no longer have to deal with some of the most frightening and bizarre conversations or fears for my life. For you see, it wasn't too long ago that I was in a relationship with who I thought was the love of my life, my princess, someone I could trust and spend the rest of my life with. Okay, maybe I'm over-exaggerating a little bit, but looking back on it today, I clearly am. But back then, that's all I could really think of. While most of my friends were in a relationship, I was left behind. Left behind to fend for myself in the great unknown of early adulthood, that being college. That was, of course, until I met her. Now, I'm not going to mention her actual name since I'm not that much of a jerk. So we're going to give her a made up one. Let's see. Let's call her Christine. Christine was a girl I met in my science class and she was pretty. She had long glistening blonde hair, blue eyes as blue as the sky above, and some glasses. Imagine your typical cute nerdy girl that guys always thought of. I didn't really think of her that way when we first met. I being the dude with low self esteem, I already knew there would be no way that she was going to give me a chance. And it started off with just us working on group projects, since we so happened to sit next to one another. However, the more we talked, the more I started to open up to Christine, and try as I did, I had fallen head over heels. It all came to a boiling point a few days before Valentine's Day, when my friends were able to convince me to ask her out on a date. Valentine's Day arrives and I muster the courage to get the words out. She was pretty shy when I mentioned it, and I already knew she was going to say no. However, to my surprise, she said yes. And before we knew it, we were boyfriend and girlfriend. And things took off like a scene out of a storybook. But in our time together, things started to become twisted and dark. You see, Christine also had self-esteem issues, which I had just learned. But some things went a little too far. Anytime she would see a girl talking to me, she would get really mad. And I'm not talking about just, hey, what's the deal? She would literally shout and tell me that if I left her, she was going to kill me. I usually laughed on the inside, thinking that this was just her way of being protective of the person that she loved, but I would be wrong. Usually some flowers or a trip to the nail salon would calm her nerves, at least for the most part. Heck, once she was over at my house and my cousin arrived unexpectedly, she hadn't seen me in a few years, and she greeted me with a warm hug. 
Christine all about lost it, and she grabbed a pair of scissors and was inches away from slamming them into my cousin. I remember having to hold Christine back and explaining to her that she was just family. Imagine my surprise when my cousin just laughed it off and she told me that she was a keeper. But later that night, Christine texted me and she apologized for the way she acted up with my cousin. I told her this over jealousy needed to stop as it was unhealthy and she agreed and promised that she was going to be a better human being. Things then settled for about three months, but that was until one day. I had been in between classes checking my notifications, and I happened to see a message from one of my classmates named Jamie. I'll summarize the message as best as I remember it. Hey, so, your girlfriend? Well, we need to talk about her. I was sitting with my friend studying outside the bookstore, and she walked over to me where she proceeded to wave a pocket knife in my face. She told me that I needed to stop talking and studying with you after class or she was going to show up to my house and kill me. Attached to the message was a picture of an envelope that was put in her volleyball locker. It simply had a picture of Jamie from her Facebook with her face crossed over and the message that said, Soon. After some back and forth, Jamie told me that she was contacting the campus police. She did, and they did an investigation, but Christine was so manipulative and such a good actor, she more or less got a slap on the wrist. But that wasn't all she got, however. As for me, I finally had enough. I was tired of being innocent and doing normal things with my classmates, such as studying. No longer did I want to be controlled any time we went out together. This was, for the very first time, I would try contacting her parents in almost the five-month relationship. They were some of the kindest, sweetest individuals I'd ever talked to, and I couldn't believe their daughter could act this way, but I later learned that she was two-faced. Anyway, I asked them for advice, and they told me that they did find it weird that Christine started to snap back at them, something that she never really used to do. She was very angry at times but she claimed that she was okay in the relationship. After giving them proof, as well as showing them messages, they told me they would have a good talk. But the next day, Christine messages me, and she was furious. Why did you tell my parents about the things I did? That should have been just between you and me. How could you turn behind my back like that? This opened up an opportunity for me to tell her in person this needed to end. I made the drive over to her place and we then spent the next 15 minutes arguing and talking about her mean behavior. By the end of the conversation, we broke up, and this is where something truly bizarre takes place. You would think that she would start crying, but no, instead she started laughing. Not the sort of laugh you get as a response from a joke. It was more like a maniac. I'm not letting you leave that easily, she said in a creepy tone. While I still had my back turned toward her, heading toward the front door, I hear her charging behind me. I look towards her direction, and I see her with one of her large kitchen knives and a smile that read, You're going to pay for that. I freaked out as I reach for the door handle, and I jump out onto the front lawn, booking it to the driveway where my car sat idle. I reach for my car keys in my pocket and I press the unlock button. Once I jump into the driver's seat, she begins pounding at the window, me being in a panic and shaking with fear, dropped the keys in between the passenger and driver's seat. For about 20 seconds, I struggled to grab it while she's screaming and telling me that I was going to be sorry when she got her hands on me. Thankfully though, my nightmare would end when I hear the familiar muffled voice of her dad. Honey, what are you doing? Her dad shouted as both himself and her mother were just returning from getting groceries. What happens next is Christine dropping the knife then heading back into the house. They were confused, but by this point I had enough. I mean, who were the parents going to believe? Obviously not me. However, luck was on my side, and they just so happened to tell me that they believed me when I told them that she came at me with a knife. Respectfully, I advised them that I would no longer be in contact with her daughter, and just like that, things were finally done with. It's like there was a flip of a switch. A day went by, nothing, a week, then a month, no more signs or messages from Christine.
I did actually get a bit worried so I contacted her parents and they told me Christine was fine and she was actually starting to date someone else. I should point out that after the breakup, I no longer saw her at school, nor did any classmates or friends of mine. I learned because she dropped out to go to a community college instead of university. Very suspicious, but I never looked more into it. By the way, it did take me a couple of years to recover from that relationship, but thankfully I'm now married. It's now been almost 10 years, and with Valentine's Day fast approaching, I reflect back on this time in my life, the time when my heart was living in a nightmare in a cage. I'm in my early 30s. I'm happily married and I've had two amazing boys, but life wasn't always about fun and games. By the time I've told my story, it's my hope that all of you out there learn from my experiences. No matter how good things might seem to be, you should always do your research. Now let me take you back to the year 2011, to a younger 23 year old college girl, that being myself. I was going through a lot during this time frame and often spent my evenings locked inside my room sitting on the computer. How I remember using video games as an escape from the madness that was college. What was really affecting me was my partner, who had seemingly just left me for some other girl because apparently I wasn't good enough. That really hurt my self-esteem and so I turned my attention to my internet friends for help. They sure did help a lot, but this sort of reassurance that I could talk to anyone online opened me up to some pretty messed up individuals. Allow me to introduce you to Damien. Act 1. I met him one day while playing Black Ops Zombies with some randoms. Seeing as he had a microphone and nobody else was talking, I plugged mine in. We quickly hit it off and we became fast friends after sharing some laughs. How I can recall playing every single night, whether it be multiplayer or zombies, Damien was becoming one of my closest pals. Soon we ended up exchanging Skype and added each other on Facebook. Nothing really seemed out of the ordinary with Damien, just a guy around my age who seemed to enjoy posting pictures of his drawings and taking selfies of himself, sort of like me. A few months went by and our friendship was going strong. It was actually playing over Minecraft when he told me that he wanted me to be his girlfriend and being dumb and naive, I said yes, but never really took it too seriously. This would be the beginning of Act 2 of Damien's personality change. He started to get very pushy with certain details. For one, he would question why I would be late to our online video game sessions, which happened because I had gotten a job at Chipotle, something I clearly mentioned to him. I tried to ignore it, but still it was in the back of my mind. Since we had been official, at least according to him, I naturally wanted to do a video chat but every time this came up, he would tell me that his webcam wasn't working or that his phone didn't have a video option. These are all huge alarm bells, but one in particular would shed some light on this mystery, a pretty creepy one. That leads us into Act 3. I was doing a research project for my art class. Funny enough, this was on Valentine's Day, as I still recall going through the box Damien had sent me through the mail, which had chocolate roses, a card, and a teddy bear. After I'd opened it, I was searching for random pictures of drawings since I needed inspiration for my project. I also had Damien on Skype with me. I forget what we were talking about, but suddenly I went silent when on my screen was a picture of Damien. Damien, do you have a deviant art account? No joke, it's like all the air was taken out of him. He went silent as I clicked on the open and new tab option. It took me to a DeviantArt account of somebody named Andy. What happens next is me scrolling through his posts. All of them were of drawings that Damien had posted to his Facebook with a few pictures that were scattered of selfies of this guy named Andy. Naturally, I was confused as I started questioning, who is Andy? Before I could get an answer, Damien hangs up the call and I then spend the next 20 minutes trying to get in touch with them. I now started to put things together. Damien and Andy were two different people. So then, who was I truly speaking to? And who sent these Valentine's Day gifts? I get my answer when 
Damien calls me later that night. He was weeping and crying and acting all apologetic, saying that he was too scared to show his face to me because of what I was going to think. I didn't care about that since I was happy with his kindness. Now that this happened though, there was no way things were going to be the same. Here's the deal. He turned it all on me and started to make me look like the bad person, saying that I would never give him a chance because I was pretty. I was furious, and in the end he told me that he was going to end it all if I didn't accept him. This guy really needed help, and I advised him to talk to a counselor or a responsible adult as this was getting pretty scary. Fast forward a year later, Act 4 of our Damien friend. As hard as it was for me to move on, I was now a few months from graduating college. I would recalled I was at my job at Chipotle cleaning some of the tables when a heavy set, 40-ish year old man walked over to me. Julia, is that really you? Wow, I didn't realize how beautiful you were in person. I'm sorry, but do I know you? The guy introduced himself as Damien, and you know what the creepiest part was? He went down on one knee, and he proposed. Everyone inside the Chipotle just looked over at us. But I was super creeped out by him. My manager had noticed and first thing she did was tell the guy he needed to leave. Thank goodness she could tell that something was wrong as I start to make my way to the back room but that's not before he grabs my arm and pulls me close. I drove 10 hours just to see you. You're going to come back home with me. One of my co-workers, Luke, who is a fellow classmate and just so happens to be on the wrestling team jumped over the front counter and along with a customer they were able to get this guy away from me the cops were eventually called and when they got there damien had already driven away but luckily the customer had taken a picture of both him and his license plate the police were able to find the guy staying at a nearby motel 6. i later learned this part but after questioning him he finally admits that he was stalking me for months and learned so many details about me, where I lived, where I worked, school, etc. It just so happened that day was the one he was going to show up to my work and propose to me. He admitted that if I didn't say yes, he was going to show up to my home later that night and take me with him by force. They found duct tape, rope, and a large knife in the back of his van. This is a really old story of mine. It happened back around 2004 when I was in college. I was doing some shopping at my local Vaughn supermarket picking up some groceries for the week. As I walked down the various aisles of produce and admired all the colorful boxes and cans, my mom ended up calling me. Hey mom, what's up? I answered her while reading the back of one of the milk cartons. Have you gotten anything for grandma for Valentine's? I looked at my phone's calendar and I completely had forgotten the holiday. After I'd broken up with my girlfriend a few months ago, where I found out she cheated on me with one of the popular college football players, the last thing I was interested in was anything to do with love. Most importantly, Valentine's Day. No, I haven't. But I'm at Vaughn's. I'll pick her up some flowers and grab chocolates and a teddy bear to go along with it. I wasn't that heartless. I loved my grandma and I'm really happy my mom had reminded me since unfortunately she would pass away just a couple of months after that. Anyway, once I was done grabbing my groceries, I walked over to the huge display where all the roses and various other assortments of goodies were. It's here I stumbled into my ex-girlfriend, we'll call her Jessica. I didn't really know how to respond to her presence, I hadn't spoke to her in months and we weren't really on good speaking terms. I ignored her as I picked out some roses, and it's while doing this she begins to curse at me and causes a scene. One of the employees walked over and wanted to know if everything was okay. I told them I was picking out flowers for my grandmother, Jessica all about lost it at this point, claiming the flowers were for another girl. So, you already moved on from me, huh? Figures you would. I was trying so hard to hold in my anger. After all, there was so much I could have said to her, but I decided not to, as I chose to walk away with my pride. Anyway, I saw Jessica exiting the Vons full of anger, and it's now I walked over to the cash register and I took a few minutes to talk with the cashier. 
She was an older woman named Grace, and she's friends with my grandma. They both went to high school together. We talked for about five minutes, seeing as this door was pretty empty, and it's while in our conversation I hear the familiar chime of the Vaughn's automated doors opening. Before I know it, I see Jessica. She was with the football player I mentioned. For the lols and the memes, we're going to call him Chad. There he is, my ex. Go and teach him a lesson. Jessica instructed this Chad guy. His eyes sort of just stood there, like, are you for real? Now, I'm pretty average height and build. I was and still am more or less about 6 foot, 180 pounds. But this guy was easily over 6 foot 4, 260 to 270 pounds of pure muscle and strength. I'll admit, I was trying to act tough, but I was sort of scared. I just didn't want to show it. The guy goes for a punch and I managed to step away as a few employees now got involved. This Chad guy, I'm not even joking to you, pulls out a switchblade and he tells me he was going to stab me. He then more or less threatens the employees to stay out of it or he was going to stab them. Naturally, we're freaking out big time as he begins to push and shove displays. But luckily, one of the employees called over a security guard from the bank that's right next to the Vons. The security guard's presence alone sent Chad and Jessica running like a pair of scared cats. Now, you would think that this was the end of this frightening and bizarre encounter. And normally, when you hear about these sorts of things, that is the case. But my story isn't like the others. You see, the store manager called the local police department and two police officers came to take our statement. Although it didn't take much convincing for them to realize, Jerk with Knife isn't going to get away. They advised this door to keep a lookout for him, as since of course, the dumb Vons had cheap, terrible security cameras with potato quality, there weren't many details that they could give. It also didn't help that I had no idea where he lived, so it's not like I could have pointed them directly to him. Also, the police told me that they could help me begin the process of me getting a restraining order against the two, but I told them that I was fine. Oh yeah, before I ended up going home, there was the fact that one of my car tires was slashed. Surely that wasn't by pure accident. All of this evidence alone would end up biting Chad and Jessica in the rear end. A few weeks passed by, and one of my college friends and I were catching up. For some reason, the topic of Chad popped up and my buddy sort of just laughed. Wait, you didn't hear about Chad? Nah. But did I tell you? The dude took out a knife when he saw me at Vaughn's. For real? Dude, that's crazy. But that's not it. Then what's up with Chad? The dude's in jail right now. Oh yeah, what for? You didn't hear? He tried robbing a 7-Eleven, but the owner got the upper hand and managed to chase him out. But not before Chad fired a gunshot at the cashier. Luckily, the cashier was okay. That was something I heard about in the news, so my buddy emailed me a news article, and sure enough, there was his name and his face. Super creepy. By the way, I haven't heard from Jessica, nor have I caught up to see what Chad's been up to. As far as I know, the two broke up, but I could care less to see or know what they are doing. I now live across the country, and I'm married to my beautiful wife, Nicole, and we have two teenage girls. They're actually the ones who told me to send you this story, since they're huge fans of the Creepy Fox. There is a lot of backstory I have to present before I get to the meat and potatoes of what it is I want to talk to all of you about, so please be patient, because I promise it's worth it. It all started in 2008, when I was still in high school. Cell phones were just starting to become popular amongst us students. I can still recount all the popular rich kids having the newest iPhone. I too longed for the attention of the cool crowd, but I was really that shy art girl who just sat alone drawing in her sketchbook. Still, I was nice to those I met, though looking back I think I could have been a little more assertive. Here's what I mean. There was a coffee shop that's since closed by the way. I would head to after school to work on my art projects. The next few hours would then consist of cups of coffee, music playing on my iPhone, and a bunch of eraser shavings scattered across the wooden table. 
While I was minding my own business one afternoon, a pretty friendly guy walked over to me and complimented my art. He couldn't have been much older than me. I had just turned 17, and he looked no older than 20 years old. He was tall and skinny. He had slicked back comb black hair and glasses, and he introduced himself as Tony. Your artwork, it really reminds me a lot of my late girlfriend. She used to love making these sorts of things. Hearing that almost brought a tear to my eye, so I gave Tony my condolences. Would it be okay if I sat here with you? He questioned. I said why not and we ended up talking for about 20 minutes. At the end of it, we exchanged phone numbers and Facebook friend requests and I honestly thought I just met and made a pretty cool friend. It started that way. Then things went silent for almost two years. No kidding. It's like one day he was there and the next he was not because I hadn't received any text messages nor had he uploaded to Facebook. Which, by the way, he had started posting some, let's just say, questionable material. Things about how he wanted certain people, air quotations here, gone. That's the most PG way I can explain it. And I tried calling him to see if he was okay, but I got no response. So therefore I looked toward his friends list, and just so happened to see one mutual friend. Her name is Amber, and we had met in junior high school. However, she went to a different school after junior high school ended. Nonetheless, I messaged her and she told me Tony had been arrested after he tried robbing a convenience store with a gun. I guess that ended up explaining his sudden leave of absence. But I wanted to know more about Tony. Might seem dumb, I know, but in a way I was glad I'd dug for more information. As for the whole girlfriend thing, that was a lie. As it turned out, what a small world. Both Tony and Amber had been dating for a while, but they had a pretty bad breakup after Tony got wasted one night and tried to attack her with a knife. That in itself was a whole show according to Amber and cops were even called. So this late girlfriend thing was most likely for me to feel sorry for him so that I would give him a chance. At least that's what I thought. She was very much alive. I wanted to know why Amber was still Facebook friends with Tony. She claimed she rarely used it, so it didn't really bother her. Whatever, to each their own, I guess. Fast forward to 2010, January, and I now have a boyfriend myself. One afternoon, we were sitting at the same beloved coffee shop, and I got a text message from an unknown number. Hey sweetie, do you remember who I am? It's been so long. Not recognizing the number, I ignore it, but hours later I get some pretty creepy messages. Things along the lines of, Why haven't you responded to me yet? It's Tony. Don't tell me you have a boyfriend. Who is that guy that was holding your hand at the coffee shop? Do I have to kill him or something? What's your problem? Reading that killing part really set something off inside of me. So I messaged him back saying that he shouldn't joke about things such as that. He then proceeded to call me all the names in the book. But that wasn't the worst part about all of it. He told me he was going to get revenge for me breaking his heart and me apparently cheating on him. Yes, as you can already begin to understand, this Tony guy had a lot of issues going for him. I mean, not once was it stated that we were boyfriend and girlfriend, so I wasn't sure how he had come to that conclusion. Either way, I blocked his phone number and I removed him as a friend from Facebook, with a block also coming some short time later. A few more weeks pass, and this is when the nightmare would come to its climax. It's a couple of days before Valentine's Day, and I was returning home after staying after school working on a group project. Of course, my parents hadn't come home yet. My mom works for a nearby hospital, and my dad is a security guard for a US bank. Normally, I was left here until around 8pm. That's when my dad usually arrived with food. At around 7.15pm, my dad texts me and says that he was on his way to pick up some Panda Express, my personal favorite. He also mentioned that he had some groceries and he was going to need my help bringing them into the house. I told him, no problem, just text or call once you're outside so I can go help. In the meantime, I went ahead and stepped into the shower seeing as I had such a long day. Now before continuing, it's important to mention that this week we were experiencing above average temperatures. 
With our air conditioning and being out for the count, this meant I relied on leaving my window open in my room. I didn't really think too much of it, since we were starting to get a nice breeze. So I shower, and about 20 minutes later, I step out to dry my hair with a towel. This was when I started to hear footsteps walking around in my room. I should mention both the restroom and my room are connected, which meant I could easily walk out to see who it was. But before checking, I look at my phone and I notice something that instantly sent chills down my spine. Where were the text messages from my dad? Not even a voicemail. I knew he would have no business walking around my room without even texting me to help him with the groceries. Till so then, who was inside my house? It surely wasn't my mom. I got the courage to take a peek through the crack of the door, and that's when I see him. I instantly recognized the black hair and the glasses. However, he now seemed to have a huge scar on his right cheek. It was Tony, with a knife in his hand. Before I could muster the courage to shout at his presence, however, my phone started to ring. My dumb self had left the ringer on. Suddenly, his lifeless stare is turned toward me, and there is now a huge grin over his face. I scrammed to lock the door as he now begins to pound on it with his huge powerful fists. Open the door. I promise, I just want to talk to you. I held back tears as I answered my dad. Hey honey, I'm outside. Can you come help me? Before he could get another word out, I scream at the top of my lungs. He knew something was wrong. I now hear footsteps race toward my room as I start hearing Tony's panicked footsteps and labored breathing. What occurs seconds later was something my dad recounted to me as I only heard it as I was still locked inside the bathroom. When he finally gets to my room, Tony all of a sudden lunges toward my dad with a knife. My dad, with his taser, was able to subdue Tony. And this is when I heard Tony fall to the ground and I hear the sound of the taser going off. Stay down or you're going to make it worse for yourself. My dad ordered Tony with one of the most intimidating tones I'd ever heard him speak. I finally unlocked the bathroom door and I'm finally able to see things for myself. There on the ground was Tony, still trying to fight back. My dad ended up putting him into a chokehold and Tony eventually settled down. Police were called while my dad detained Tony in my bathroom and he was taken into the back of their police car eventually. After what seemed like hours of questioning, we were able to clear our names once I showed police all the disturbing messages that Tony had sent me, including the knife he had on him that night. Rightfully so, he was arrested. And since then, I have never seen, nor have I heard from Tony, ever again. This was 2007, Valentine's Day evening in rural Wisconsin. My wife and I had just returned from a dinner at her parents' house, and we were now relaxing in our bed after a long day. My wife was reading a book, and I was watching a movie that was playing on the TV. At around 10 p.m., my wife fell asleep, but for whatever reason, I was having difficulty doing the same thing. Perhaps it was because of all the soda I drank and the sugar that was keeping me from reaching dreamland. Therefore, I got up and went into the living room so I could play some Xbox 360 while I laid on the couch. Fast forward about two hours later, I'm deep into playing my video game, when all of a sudden I began to hear a light knocking at my front door. At first I thought it was the game and its various sound effects tricking me, but as I turned the volume down and I focus, I realized that wasn't the case, as this was something from the real world. Therefore, I got up, putting my warm fuzzy slippers on, and I walked a few feet over to the front door. Hello? Is anyone home? I hear a voice say from outside my front door. Is everything okay? I responded back with a tone of concern. I need an ambulance. Can I please come in and call them? At this moment, I had taken a look into the peephole and I saw something quite bizarre. There on my front porch stood a figure with a hoodie over their head. But as creepy as that was, I could also make out a small knife in this individual's left hand. I remember stepping back and getting this really deep sinking feeling in my stomach as a stranger that's standing outside once again repeats if they can come in and call for help. I played along and said that I would be more than willing to call for them, now realizing there doesn't seem to be an issue with this person. No, please let me in. This is serious. 
I told the guy who was out there that I was going to call the police and that if there was any problem, he could deal with them. That or my shotgun could have had a word with them. Mentioning the shotgun appeared to have worked because I heard their footsteps walk off my porch and then I could hear their footsteps start walking on the dirt. At this moment, I took a look into the living room window and I saw the individual step into what looks like a dark blue minivan. They drove off just a few moments later and once I could no longer see him, I immediately head back to my room to check up on my wife. She is still fast asleep and she has no idea to what just happened. Safe to say I locked ourselves in the room until the police arrived roughly 20 minutes later. Once in their safety, I gave them my statement and they said they would do their best to try and find this potential home intruder. However, with such little details, they never did find anyone matching my description, that being of a person in a dark blue hoodie and a typical dark blue minivan. Now after what happened, we became a bit more secure of our property, installing a security system, getting a dog, and also installing cameras. Bear in mind, we're pretty much out in the boonies, and with neighbors being so far apart, it's very rare you hear of these sorts of scenarios. Also, just to note, none of our neighbors ever reported having anyone show up to their house late at night, so whoever this was appeared to have left the area, where, I hope, they didn't continue their antics. I don't know, since this happened, I've heard of similar situations happening, although these are in different states and also sometimes different countries. In fact, I believe I might have heard a similar story happen to someone in one of your previous videos, but I'd have to go back and find exactly which one it was. Anyway, if I could ask a question, I'll say this. Is there anyone out there who has had something remotely close like this happen to them, or you know someone that's had a similar experience? If so, please leave it in the comments section so I know I wasn't the only one, and maybe I can reach out to you. Thanks. I greatly appreciate you all. This is probably not as scary as some of the other stories you've heard the Creepy Fox cover before, but I thought it was worth submitting anyway as I'm a huge fan and I enjoy listening on a nightly basis. At the time of this occurrence, I was working a part-time job at my local mall at one of those stands that sells chocolates and candies alongside cards and letters. Now even though my little store, if you want to refer to it as such, was located in front of a very busy Sears, we rarely got customers. Those we did get were usually teenagers around my age or children looking to get their parents to get them to get some candies and sweets. On very rare occasions, we would get weird customers. However, as there are a couple of security guards who make their rounds near me, the only bad thing that has happened to me before was just a customer getting mad because we didn't have Reese's cups. Yeah, no kidding. But okay, let's jump to a couple of days before Valentine's Day. We had just gotten a shipment of flowers that we had on display to sell alongside all the things I mentioned before. During this shift, I was working in the evening. Flowers were going like hotcakes, with people coming up to my store in groves. I recall while ringing up this really nice woman who was with her daughter, I noticed a man, probably 50-ish years old, who could easily have been my dad, was just staring over at me from one of the nearby benches. He gave me this really creepy half smile look and this wave and I just ignored him opting to finish what I was currently doing. Once the woman and the little daughter left, I took a look at my phone to see if perhaps I got in a text message from a classmate who was supposed to send me their part of our group project, but there was nothing. I sighed at this lazy classmate of mine as I focused my attention back up into the cash register. The man from just moments ago is walking over to my candy stand. Didn't you notice me waving at you? The man said in a somewhat disgruntled manner as I felt his eyes begin to stare quite literally into my soul. No, sorry, I was busy ringing up a customer. Was there something I could help you with? He calls me something that I don't think I can really repeat here. It's that offensive. And I basically have to tell him he's got to leave or I was going to notify the mall security. He refuses and downplays his crude statement, saying it was a joke and that I should be the one to apologize as I was being rude for ignoring him. 
I took a step back and gave him an expression of, really dude, before I began thinking of what I want to say. But then another customer walked over and the man went silent, turning around and walking in the other direction. As I've told this story to many friends, they know just how weirded out I was by the entire thing. But I truly thought it was going to just be a one-off occurrence and maybe that man was just looking to blow off some steam for whatever reason. It sucks that I had to be the one on the receiving end, but what can you really do? Fast forward a few days after Valentine's Day and I'm coming back from two days off. My co-worker Natalie told me that the other day while she was working, this man came over to the store and was asking for the girl with the glasses and the short brunette hair, saying he was with her uncle and needed to get her phone number. Natalie found the whole thing weird and explained that she had just started working there the day before and didn't know who he was talking about. Now, I knew that there was no way it could have been my uncle as he lives about three hours from my city. Not only that, but if he wanted to really contact me, I had him on Facebook. Also, he could have asked my dad for my phone number if it was really that important. I got a bit suspicious. I told my co-worker Natalie that we should just ignore it and that would be the end of it. Fast forward to about three hours into my shift and a familiar face walks over to my candy shop. It's the same 50 year old man from the other day and he kind of just stood there looking at some of the chocolates and decorations as customers were waiting in line for me to ring them up with their bags of treats. Now what happens next was completely unexpected and creepy to say the least. Out of seemingly nowhere, the man pulls out a little box and a ring and in front of all these customers, proposes to me. He says that I was his princess and that he was my Prince Charming as he was here to take me to his magic kingdom, far from the so-called kings that controlled my existence. I think he might have been referring to my manager. Honestly, I wish I was joking here, but I'm afraid I'm not. Anyway, fellow customers are just looking at him with this look of disbelief, and as I begin to address his ridiculous proposal, he reaches for my arm and grasps it tightly. He pulls me forward, which causes me to bump into the front counter, and that hurt like a mother, I'll tell you. It's at this moment a customer is telling him to knock it off, and suddenly he loses it and tries to punch him. What a mistake that was. The customer, who I like to refer to as the champ, punches the creep square on in the temple who then lets go of my arm and falls back and bumps into a display of birthday cards. Hey, are you okay? The kind gentleman asks me, as who I found out is his wife is waving down a security guard. Yeah, I am. Just my arm. It hurts a little bit from his tight grasp, but I should be okay. No kidding, but Prince Charming. Ugh, I hate saying that, but whatever gets up and then tries jumping over the front counter, saying directly to me, let's get out of here honey. The champ, now there's a name I can get behind, literally grabs this dude by the waist and does a sort of German suplex like you see Brock Lesnar do against his opponents in the ring. Finally, two security guards arrive and along with the champ are able to take him away for questioning. I was as you'd expect, full of emotions. I was angry. I was confused, but most importantly, I was scared. Why? Why was it me out of all people? I wish I could sit here and give you an explanation, but I really can't. Anyway, this is getting kind of long, isn't it? Sorry. I just wanted to conclude with, I only worked there for a few weeks after the incident, and I quit as I couldn't feel comfortable with working at that candy stand. I never did see that creep again, so I'm not really sure whatever happened to him other than I hope that suplex he received taught him a valuable lesson. The only reason that I remember this happening on Valentine's Day of 2011 in my small town in North Carolina was because I ended up getting rejected by a girl that I had a crush on ever since that semester had begun a few weeks prior. It was quite devastating, but my friends told me I was pretty brave for getting the courage to tell her my feelings. Which, yeah, I guess that was true, and I eventually moved on and got a girlfriend who I'm still with right now. But that afternoon was quite a downer. 
All I wanted to do was get some donuts from one of my local donut shops at home, turn on Netflix, and just watch a bunch of movies with my dog sitting by my side. And so that's how it was going to begin. But once my final class let out at 3 p.m., I hopped on my bicycle and rode 20 minutes to the donut shop as I eagerly awaited to get my hands on some heavenly sweet goodness that would look to alleviate my stress. With my mouth watering and salivating, I soon arrived to said donut shop and I see apart from just one other car that's in the drive through it looks empty inside. Awesome, I thought. It would be a quick in and quick out and I can head home and enjoy my afternoon. Megan, the owner of the donut shop, welcomed me with open arms as the front doorbell chimed and a refreshing blast of air conditioning hit my face, like that satisfying feeling of when you jump into a swimming pool on a hot summer's day. I saw inside the display of donuts the typical flavored glazed, chocolate, and jelly filled. Perhaps what really got to me, however, were the Valentine's inspired donuts, which instantly soured my mood. Megan noticed this and asked why I looked so gloomy, and I quickly mentioned the girl I asked out who rejected me. Megan felt bad and ended up offering to give me a free donut, and I actually went ahead and accepted the offer. Now, as I was talking with Megan and picking out my other donuts, a man in an oversized khaki-colored trench coat walked in through the back door. I only noticed him for a brief second as he passed by my peripheral vision and then got behind and just stood there for no reason. Hey, you got any smokes on ya? I hear a deep voice say behind me, as this garbage-like smell enters my nostrils from what I would find out would be this guy's really bad B.O. No, sorry, I don't, I reply with a half smile on my face, as he starts to look in all directions and then begins mumbling to himself. Megan looked at me and thought it was strange, but ended up continuing my order finally getting my sweets into a pink box, I then went ahead and handed over my $10 that was on my way. Or so I thought. While I'm preparing to take my seat on my bicycle, I happened to look into the donut shop through the outside window, and I saw that the man who was behind me moments ago was reaching for the cash register trying to take out money. I don't know what came over me in that moment, but I dropped my donuts and I rushed inside not even realizing the fight I was about to get myself into. I tell the guy to knock it off and just leave, and he suddenly pushes me back, telling me to mind my own business or I was going to get hurt. Megan, meanwhile, is struggling with the man and trying to fend him off, as a baker in the back is calling for the police. I got up and start approaching him again, and as I'm just a few inches from socking him right in the nose, I saw him put his hand into his trench coat pocket. I connected with his cheek and he stumbles back for a few seconds, as what sounds like an object now hits the ground. I took a look, and I saw a switchblade which was lying about halfway beneath the front counter and the tiles where I currently stood. My heart immediately began racing, and thinking had I not knocked some sense into him quite literally, he would have held on to that switchblade and possibly have stabbed me. With this revelation, I kicked the switchblade further underneath the front counter as it ended up sliding over to Megan. She then grabbed it, and suddenly this man books it out the way he came from, not even saying another word or making some sort of struggle to fight back. Now thank the lord that cops weren't even that far, because when they searched the area, they were able to locate him quite easily in a nearby alleyway, though what would you expect when he's got a khaki colored trench coat that easily stands out? Anyway, I gave my statement, and after a bit of a talk with the police, I ended up heading back home, though that afternoon's mood had changed completely. By the way, in case you're wondering, it turned out the guy who I stopped that afternoon was a local homeless man who was well known by the police department for being a troublemaker. Unfortunately, that donut shop closed a couple of years ago, however, I still will occasionally talk to the owner as my mom and dad are really good friends with her and her husband. I haven't had too many scary things happen in recent memory. However, there was one incident that happened to my wife and I in early 2009 during our senior year of high school that we'll look back on and have ourselves a good laugh about. 
The only thing is, when it first occurred, there was nothing to laugh about, and we were genuinely freaked out. It was on Valentine's Day, and our high school was having their yearly traditional Valentine's Day dance. We attended alongside our fellow classmates and friends, but we decided to leave a bit early, as my wife, then my girlfriend, wasn't, and still isn't the best with large crowds, as she gets a lot of anxiety. Anyway, once we left the school parking lot, I asked my girlfriend if she wanted to grab some milkshakes and then go for a nice romantic drive around town to help calm down her anxiety. She was ecstatic about my suggestion. After getting our sugary beverages, we start driving up into the local hills on the other side of our small town where there's a cliffside that lets you see the entire city. It's very beautiful at night, not the evening such as that one. The lights from all the buildings looked like stars. It took us roughly 20 minutes to drive out of the main city and reach that quiet area. But when we did, we rolled down the windows and just got lost staring at the scenery as some music played over the radio. We must have been there for no more than 15 minutes when I happened to look into my rear view mirror. It was strange, but for a second I was able to see a dark figure that mismatched with a tree surrounding us. I did a double take just to make sure I wasn't hallucinating. After looking for roughly 10 seconds, I wrote it off as just my over-imagination. Well, lost in conversation and music playing on the radio, my girlfriend and I jump a few inches out of our seats. One minute later, we both hear what sounds like knocks on the back trunk. This time, my attention is focused to two large men wearing oversized jackets who are each carrying a brown paper bag with what appears to be like a bottle. Now bear in mind, we had the windows down to let some fresh air in, and I have an old car that requires you to manually roll up the windows. So just put it in your head, when we're pretty much racing against time to ensure that they don't try reaching in for us. Well, we kinda just sat there as one of the men begins to knock on my window, telling my girlfriend to step out of the vehicle, otherwise they were going to make their way in by force. My girlfriend started to freak out and cry and I'm pretty much telling these guys to back off as my protective boyfriend's senses are kicking in. They didn't really seem to be intimidated by my statements since they continued to pound at the windows and even attempted to open the door as I'm beginning to start the vehicle. Finally, as the engine comes back to life, I start to back out out of the small dirt parking lot only to see that there's one last thing that these men are willing to try. You see, as we're leaving, we saw the men return to the tree line and about 30 seconds later, now on the road back to the city, a decent sized pickup truck is beginning to chase my girlfriend and I, which has its headlights on full blast. Now here's the even scarier part. They are basically bumping into the back of my vehicle and they're driving erratically as they're swerving between our lane and the incoming traffic lane. I am just so thankful that neither of us crashed that evening, but those five minutes of being chased in the middle of the night were like something you might see in a horror movie. It was when we reached the city limits, we drive over to a shell gas station and we just watch from one of the pumps as the two men in the truck pretty much did a 180 and drove back the way in which they came from. We were both at a loss of words as one might expect, and even when we did call and report the incident to police, we had difficulty relaying all the information as we were clearly shaken up. Last, but certainly not least, I remember officers escorting us back to my girlfriend's house, and after I dropped her off, I drove back to my house. Unfortunately, nothing ever came up with those two men in the truck but we do like to believe it was a one-off incident of a couple of drunks looking to give a couple of lovebirds quite the scare. Again, I'm just thankful that nobody was hurt that evening because I don't know what I would have done had anything happened to my girlfriend. I remember specifically this happening in 2013 as that was the year I got engaged to my boyfriend, now my husband. It was in February a couple of evenings before Valentine's Day, and I had just finished clocking out of my job working as a trainer at 24 Hour Fitness. As I started driving over to get some dinner at Subway, not exactly the healthiest food, but I digress. 
I remembered that I needed to make sure to get some roses and chocolates for Valentine's Day, so I ended up picking up my food, an ordinary tuna sandwich with white bread and extra onions, then I walked over to a CVS pharmacy that's located in the same shopping center as the subway. I proceeded to grab some nice roses and said chocolates I mentioned, and I proceeded to pay. It's as I'm exiting the CVS pharmacy and returning to my vehicle that things were about to get interesting as I looked back and refer to it as such. I first realized there was an issue, I use air quotations here, when I noticed a red Toyota Tundra, dirty that looked as if it hadn't been washed in months, parked next to my 2010 Volkswagen buggy. That kind of gave me the chills as it looked like a vehicle I was familiar with. You see, at that point in my life, I was dealing with this really obsessive guy at the gym who quite frankly didn't know the meaning of let it go and boundaries. And no, I'm not referring to the song from Frozen. It was this buff dude, late 20s, early 30s, who I like to refer to as the show-off. For my fellow gym goers, you know exactly who I'm talking about. Those guys who like to wear those really tight t-shirts and shorts and then make a bunch of grunting sounds when lifting weights. Or I guess as many people refer to them as chads. Yeah, those guys. I was dealing with a very obsessive and aggressive one who would always try to ask me out on a date, even though I always told them I had a boyfriend and I wasn't interested. I guess it was sort of my fault for being too nice with people and not really knowing how to put my foot down and standing up for myself, a fault that I unfortunately have to catch myself on even today. Anyway, I made the assumption it was just a coincidence, but as I'm nearly feet from grabbing my car's door handle, I hear a familiar voice. Erica? Is that you? Wow, what a small world. You got Subway too, huh? I looked behind me and instantly got chills down my spine. It's Mr. Jim Guy, we're going to call him that, as he approaches me with this really creepy smile on his face. Wait, where are you going? Look, if you can just give me two minutes of your time, I recall him saying, before I enter my Volkswagen and begin putting the key into the ignition, Mr. Jim Guy started banging on my door and asking if I could talk to him as he had something important to tell me. I pretty much drove straight out of there, ignoring anything he would blabber out of his mouth. Anyway, this is just the beginning of what's to come that ultimately would lead to quite a scary encounter on Valentine's Day evening. So we fast forward to that day, and I'm at home with my boyfriend just sitting on the couch and watching movies as we ate some pizza. At around 9.30pm, I got up from the couch and head over to the restroom that's all the way in the back of the house. From the restroom, you have a little window, which, if you looked into it, it allows you to see my backyard. Nothing really extraordinary about it. However, on this evening as I'm doing my business, I could hear audible footsteps just feet from where I sat, with only the wall separating us. The window was open, with the window screen of course. Well, all of a sudden, I hear something scratching at said window, and I start to get a bit alarmed, as my boyfriend was on the couch just moments earlier. Thinking he was trying to play a prank on me, I call out my boyfriend's name, only to be met with silence. I wait a few seconds in confusion, and then call out his name again. But this time, I can hear what sounds like something being cut. That would be the screen. Well, I knew at that point something was seriously wrong, which is why I basically run like a sprinter in an Olympics competition down the hallway and into my boyfriend's arms. I tell him somebody was trying to cut the screen in the restroom and he instantly advises me to lock myself in the bedroom. Why he didn't follow me, I think it was his adrenaline taking over and common sense being thrown out the door because no matter how much I begged him to follow me, he wouldn't want to. Now this next part comes from the perspective of my boyfriend, however I was able to hear the struggle thus I could back it up. My boyfriend told me that as he started to make his way down the hallway, Someone walked out of my restroom with a little box cutter in his hands. That someone would be the gym guy I mentioned from before. My boyfriend, with all these emotions running through his system, essentially told the guy off and said that if he didn't get out of there within the next few seconds, the police arresting him was going to be the least of his concerns. Moments after that, I hear the gym guy mumble something. However, not even my boyfriend understood what he said 
and with that he returns into the restroom and hops out the window. By the way, I was on the phone talking to 911 as this is happening. I even looked out my bedroom window and saw the same red Toyota Tundra parked across the street, which was directly underneath a street light. At any rate, I did manage to snap a few photos of Mr. Jim Guy as he's running across the street, still with the box cutter in hand, while 911 is on speaker. And roughly 10 minutes later, two police officers showed up to my house. My boyfriend and I proceeded to give our statement, including a good description of Mr. Jim Guy and his vehicle. Once that was taken care of, police officers said they were going to check the surrounding neighborhoods, but as you can already come to conclude, Mr. Jim Guy was long gone. Well, Mr. Jim Guy was eventually questioned by police, and he admitted to breaking into my house and even stalking me. So, after some talks with my family's attorney and getting his advice, I filed a restraining order against Mr. Jim Guy where he was not allowed to be anywhere near me whatsoever, not that I think he would want to be, knowing about my boyfriend. In the end, weeks and months continue to pass by like the seasons, and I never saw that creep again, which is good because I really hope he got some help and ended his days of stalking the people he liked, including finding out where they live and breaking into their houses. So friends, with Valentine's Day fast approaching now, I just want to say the following. Stay safe, and if you suspect somebody might be following you, speak up and don't be like me and wait until something really bad happens. This happened to me on Valentine's Day of 2013. I had just come out of my English writing class at 10pm and I couldn't stop thinking about food. The last time I'd ate was earlier that day for lunch, at about 1pm at the university's cafeteria. All I had was just a plain old boring sandwich I packed from home and a smoothie I bought at Jamba Juice, so it was decided I would get myself a bite to eat at In-N-Out. Here's the thing with me. I don't usually like to pay with cards, so I rely on cash to make purchases. However, one look inside my purse and all I remember having was two dollars and some change. Not exactly enough for a hamburger. Maybe just a shake, but that's it. Well, considering I'm too tired to make something at home, and I'm still so insistent in paying with cash, I decided I would just stop by the ATM machine that's nearby my university. So I get into my car, make a short 5 minute drive to the school's first credit union and I pull up ready to make my transaction. Just a quick little visual of this area to give you an idea. You have the school's first credit union building, the parking space is in front of it, and then a short distance away there's an IHOP with its own parking spaces too. Behind the school's first credit union are some offices that were currently closed. I only wanted to bring up those details because apart from just some cars that were parked next to the IHOP where I currently was, it's pretty empty and quiet. The only movement I saw came from the nearby street and cars passing by and the bushes and trees moving with the breeze, but I digress. I get out of my car, go up a couple of steps, and then place my card in the ATM machine so I can begin my transaction. About 10 seconds later, I hear a sound come from one of the nearby bushes that startles me and actually causes me to jump for a quick second. I take a look, half expecting to see a squirrel or some other little animal, but instead it's a full-sized grown man. He appeared homeless, had a white t-shirt on with some black pants. At first, he just kind of stood there staring at me and then whispering something to himself it almost seemed as if he was talking to somebody else who wasn't there, but I wasn't too sure nor was I going to judge him. Right as the money popped out of the machine, the man now tells me, Hey, can you please give me that money? I took one look at him and said, My dude, are you serious? I wasn't just going to give this guy $20. I wasn't trying to be mean, but I barely had any more money in my account apart from that $20. I'm just a poor college student as it is. So I grabbed my receipt and turned my back to him to head to my car, but this was a big mistake and I should have kept my eyes on him the whole time, but as I make my way down the couple of steps, take a few paces to my car, and what I hear behind me sends shivers down my spine. Give me that money now, the man says, as he now has a small knife. 
That sent chills down my spine. I dove into my driver's seat, locked the door, and then immediately called 911. The man, for whatever reason, decided to kick at the side of my door as I'm pulling away, and I even happened to hear him threaten me one last time, saying that he was going to kill me. Instead of driving away completely, since he was armed with a knife, I drove over to the IHOP so I could make sure I kept an eye on this creep. Thankfully, the man didn't follow me over. He just paced back and forth for a few seconds before reaching back down into the bushes. I watched him as he walked away as if nothing had just transpired. Cops did get there and after a short search, they find the knife-wielding homeless man in a nearby alleyway smoking out of a glass pipe. Needless to say, frightened but glad to have not been stabbed, I bid my adieu to the police officers after giving my statement and I made my way home instead, where I make myself a cup of noodles and spend the next hour talking to my roommate to try my best to calm my nerves. The next day, I had the day off, as did my roommate, and even though she was there with me, I couldn't help but think for some reason, the man would somehow break out of custody, come find me, and demand I give him the $20, or stab me. That never happened, obviously, but it was a recurring nightmare I had for weeks after. Thankfully, I haven't had anything else scary like that happen to me again, and I just hope that it remains that way. Treat every day as if it was your last. That's a saying I'm sure most of you listening have heard at least one time in your life. It's meant to motivate people not to take life for granted, and to teach others that if you have a dream you're striving for, take today to make those initial steps. Not saying you have to have it all completed in one day, but set up a little program to reach that goal. While goal making has nothing to do with my scary experience, the whole don't take life for granted really comes into play. Because one minute everything was fine and next moment we were fearing for our life. Such is what happened to me on Valentine's Day of 2011. For reference this takes place in Compton, California. I'm sure just mentioning that city name, a lot of you will think of popular songs and pop culture. Well, how about this? On this evening, my girlfriend and I had gone to this really nice restaurant to celebrate not only Valentine's Day, but her upcoming birthday, which was on the 17th. Food was great. I had myself steak dinner with some mashed potatoes, and my girlfriend had herself a salmon with a salad. After food, we drove around town for a while and we decided we'd go get some ice cream before I dropped my girlfriend off at her place. When we arrived at the ice cream shop, they told us that they were going to be closing in about 5 minutes, but they would be more than happy to serve us. There went our hanging out at the ice cream shop and just talking. So we grabbed ourselves a couple of cups of sugary creamy goodness to go and we made our way to my girlfriend's neighborhood. We now spend about 15 minutes just sitting in my car talking about life and listening to music, and just relaxing and enjoying the cool February evening. So far, nothing scary. Well, out of nowhere, we ended up hearing a loud pop, which at first we thought was one of the neighborhood kids lighting up some firecrackers. It happens occasionally. Then there was another pop, and we knew at this moment what we were hearing were actually gunshots. My girlfriend and I took cover as we soon began to hear arguing, and even a car start up nearby. I happen to have looked up from my seat, and at that moment, I kid you not, a round actually hits the back of my vehicle, which makes my girlfriend scream. I held her tightly and held back my tears, as I feared they were targeting us, whoever it was that was shooting. However, we would soon learn the target was the vehicle that was near us. Remember how I said I heard a car start up? It just so happened that a bullet ricocheted and hit my car. After what felt like hours, but was only maybe 30 seconds, we hear tires screeching on the pavement, and things now fell silent. We looked up, and we can see as some men are walking out of one of the nearby homes. From the looks of it, it appeared one of them had been shot in the arm as we can see some blood dropping down. My girlfriend recognized him as one of the oldest neighbor's sons. And at this point, we call 911 to get him some medical attention. Luckily, he survived his injury. Police did do their investigations and whatnot, and when I talked with my girlfriend a couple of days later, she told me about what happened. 
It turned out that there were some arrests due to a drug bust. Also, as for the shootout, that was because of a deal gone wrong between that son and the ones that were buying. They were the ones who shot at them, who at the same time happened to have hit my car in the process. I did get the car fixed. That wasn't a problem. But you can imagine how it left my girlfriend and I traumatized, but thankful to God to be alive. She and I have since gotten married and we've relocated to Riverside, California, where to this day, we haven't had any more encounters like this happen to us ever again. Anyone else remember when you were a kid and when Valentine's Day rolled around, you'd get all excited for the candy and treats you would get at school? I remember those years when my mom and I would go shopping and grab chocolates, candies, and those little Valentine's cards that come in those boxes that you can hand out to your classmates. I know I still have some of them somewhere in a box in my attic. I just need to find them so I can reread some of those messages my friends wrote me. Now, while I can spend hours talking about all the good times in elementary school, as would anyone else, I want to instead focus on what happened to me in my school on Valentine's Day of 2003. It's a day I will never forget. Obviously, I am not going to remember the exact dialogues of everything said, so understand that this is going to involve paraphrasing. I also enlisted the help of a friend of mine to assist me with remembering some of the details I missed. We will call her Veronica. She is the only friend from elementary school I still talk to. She remembers this day as well, as she was in the same room as me. So to skip a lot of the boring details, I want to jump to after lunch that day. All of us students had returned back to our classroom and were now starting the Valentine's Day mini party. We're going around our class handing over our little goodies and cards and laughing amongst ourselves. As my teacher sat there at his table, grading some papers and listening to the music he had playing over his computer. It was about 15 minutes in and we're all suddenly interrupted by an alarm, followed by a message over the intercom system. We're going into lockdown. This is not a drill. 911 has been called. Please lock all your doors and stay away from any windows. All us kids start breaking out, but in our innocent sixth grader minds, we think that this has to be some sort of prank. It wasn't. My teacher now instructs everyone to get into the back corner of the room as he locks our door and closes the blinds and shuts down the lights. Naturally, we're all starting to wonder just what exactly is going on as some of the kids start laughing and making jokes. I think this was their way to cope with the current events that were unfolding before us. I remember my teacher getting on the phone and after he hung up, we saw the fear in his eyes and we knew that this lockdown wasn't just something innocent. One of the students overheard the staff on the phone mention the word knife to our teacher since she was close to him and when we asked him about it, he just responded back with, Yes, but we need to remain quiet and we need to remain calm until the police arrive. About five minutes into the lockdown, one of the kids, for whatever reason, decided to break away from the group that's huddled at the back of the room and now crawls over to peek through the blinds. My teacher, in his hushed voice, is angry and telling him to come back. What my classmates saw scared him so bad that he immediately ran back in fear, trying not to cry. Moments later, we can see the door handle is beginning to shake and everyone starts to freak out. Don't open the door. He's got a huge knife. It's not the police, our classmate said, as my teacher then tries to comfort him and tell him to remain quiet. Moments that seemed to go on for an agonizing eternity that were only maybe less than 15 seconds, the door handle stopped shaking and we all start to let out sighs of relief, at least for now. A few minutes later, we're able to hear the sounds of the police sirens and even the sound of a helicopter above. My best guess was the whole police station had been called in. Needless to say, after a total of 45 horrifying minutes filled with anxiety and fear, the lockdown is lifted and a police officer comes to our door to let us all out. By now, the school is filled with everyone's parents, including mine, who couldn't stop crying and thanking the heavens above that I and everybody else was safe. So in conclusion, here's the lowdown on what happened. It turned out that a guy who was on drugs and who was completely out of it 
was walking around the nearby neighborhoods with a large hunting knife. He just so happened to have walked onto our campus, and one of the hall monitors noticed him. She immediately ran into a nearby room to notify the front office, who then called the police and issued the lockdown. It's just crazy to think that we were all involved in such a scary incident, but if there was one good thing, no one, including the drugged up guy, were hurt. Well, if I remember correctly, I do believe they tased him. Years have since passed, and any time I think about elementary school, that scary event sticks out to me the most. Really just goes to show you that anything can happen, even on Valentine's Day. Valentine's Day is supposed to be that one time of the year where everyone is all super lovey-dovey and whatnot. Not a day where you expect to have a life-changing, altering experience that's going to leave you traumatized for months to come. But alas, that's what I found myself experiencing last year. For a bit of context, I'm an 18-year-old male, and this takes place in the state of Utah. This Valentine's night, I was home alone as my dad, who is a security guard, was at his job like normal. It's just myself and him since my mother had passed away a few years prior and my dad had yet not remarried. No longer being a child, this wasn't the end of the world. Any other young adults and teenagers know that when your parents aren't home, you're basically free to do whatever you want without having to suffer the embarrassment of your parents seeing or hearing you do silly things. Anyway, no shenanigans were involved that night other than ordering a pizza from Domino's with the money my dad left me on the kitchen table and watching JoJo's Bizarre Adventure Stardust Crusaders for the third time in my living room. We have a 60 inch flat screen TV in there, so it was always made for the perfect binge watch. At about 7.30pm, halfway through my medium pepperoni pizza, I get a knock at my front door. I've always been the paranoid type, so at first I did ignore the knocks. However, when I recognized the voices of the kids calling out my name, I had a feeling what was going on right now. I open my front door and it's the two neighbor kids asking if I could go and grab the ball for them, which just so happened to have gone over the brick wall as they played. They also asked if they could come say hello to my pet rabbits, who are seriously some of the cutest little fluff balls you'll ever meet. I agreed and I ushered them back in there as we head to the backyard and I grab their ball, which happened to have been stuck in the tree back there. After a couple of minutes, the kids exit through the side gate and I return back to my pizza and Jotaro and company on their quest to find Dio. Fast forward about an hour later, I'm in the kitchen washing some dishes and I happen to hear noise coming from my backyard. My rabbits are silent, and it's not like it was raining or windy or anything, so what exactly was I hearing? I thought to myself for maybe 15 seconds, and then I said, perhaps it was the kids grabbing their ball again. They will sometimes just climb over the wall, but their dad would always tell them not to do that, since 1. it's dangerous, and 2. you don't just go into your neighbor's backyard without permission. Bless those kids' hearts, they just don't know any better. Well, I figured I would check up on them because the last thing I needed was for the ball to be stuck in the tree again, and they then try setting up a ladder and climbing up to get it. So I dry my hands, grab my cell phone, and I make my way outside, heading down the little walkway that's in between my garage and the back part of my house. Little was I to know what I was about to stumble into. As I turn the corner, ready to see the kids, I have all the hair stand up on my back when I happen to catch the process of a person, dressed in all black, with a ski mask covering their identity, prying open my back door with a rusty old crowbar. Without even thinking, I shout out, What are you doing in my backyard? I was ready to throw hands, even though this dude has a weapon. Well, it turned out the crowbar was the least of my concerns. He doesn't just run away like any normal burglar might have when he got caught. Actually, he does the complete opposite. He pulls out a handgun. Now he tells me to be quiet or he was going to shoot me dead right there on the spot. Don't you dare call the cops or you're dead. I freaked out. I didn't care at that point. I booked it down the walkway, half expecting I was going to be shot in the back at any second. I guess when adrenaline and fear takes over, 
Your body will just do things without you having full control of it. I dove through the kitchen door. I lock it, and then I run upstairs toward my dad's room where he's got a couple of guns himself. I grabbed the shotgun and loaded that bad boy up, locking myself in and calling 911. The whole time I kept thinking the guy I stumbled into was going to break into my house, find me, and try to silence me for good. But little would he know that I have my own self-defense. Thank God he didn't break in. But by the time the police drove up into my neighborhood, the potential home burglar was now long gone. Officers did a patrol of my neighborhood, however, and they never did catch the guy, which left me super scared and paranoid for months. My neighbor, the dad of the two kids, did tell me he heard me scream when I ran from the burglar, but of course he never saw the man. We just came to the conclusion that he must have climbed his way back over the backyard wall from the back alleyway. Just crazy how nobody saw him. My dad came home early that night from his work, and I ended up staying over at my grandma and grandpa's house across town for a few days, since I was so paranoid and scared to stay at my own house. We did get all the locks changed, a security system installed, and luckily, since then, there has been no more incidents of scary happenings. I do wonder to this day, however, would that guy have shot me, or was he just bluffing? Also, was that gun real? I'll never know. Which in a way, I'd rather just not think about that. This is an experience that I've been wanting to share for quite a while, and it's only now I decided to share it online for the world to hear. I hope it can teach others to speak up when something is wrong. Before I begin my story, which has its climax on Valentine's Day of 2015, I need to first provide a bit of context, that way you get a better sense and an understanding. I'm female, I was 22 at the time, and I was working at a store that sold bird supplies, as well as adoptions for birds. Such birds as cockatiels, parakeets, aka budgies, macaws, doves, just to name a few. When I first began working there, we would have this visitor who for this retelling we're going to call Brian. Brian was a homeless man who, for some reason, loved coming into the store just to talk with the birds and even have conversations with us, the employees. But this wasn't really a problem, and I actually can tell you I considered him like a friend at first, However, over a few weeks that he would show up to the store, his visits would be less about the birds and more about the employees, more importantly, about me. These conversations he would try to have with me started off with him asking me stuff like, Hey, do you have a boyfriend? Or other times, you want to go and grab some dinner and hang out? I would always ignore these little advances and quickly change the subject to birds and he would just go along with it probably realizing my lack of interest. One day he shows up like normal, and he brings up the whole want to go out on a date thing, while trying to be sneaky with his wording. When I change the subject, this time instead of just being like, okay, whatever, he snapped at me, calling me a bunch of curse words and then throwing a temper tantrum on how I was playing hard to get, and that I had to stop leading him on. Yeah, in no way or shape or form was I ever doing such a thing. I mean, I even kept telling him I had a boyfriend and that there was no way I was just going to dump him and begin a new life with Brian. Brian stormed out of the store that afternoon, but what he told me, which would haunt me for weeks, was something I would soon never forget. I'm going to make you pay. Just you wait. When you least expect it, you'll pay. That stuck to me like glue. One of the customers who happened to have been there and heard the whole thing approached me and asked me if I was okay. I told them I was a bit shaken up, but it wasn't anything I couldn't handle. I had a talk with my boss later that shift, and he told me that if he ever showed up again, not only would he be kicked out, but he would call the cops because now he was starting to become a problem for me. Well, he did show up one other time, but my boss saw him and immediately kicked him out and threatened to call the cops. That seemed to have worked, and things fell silent for about six months. Now with that bit of leading up and context out of the way, I present you the scary encounter I would have. It's the morning of Valentine's Day, 2015, 
and I'm working in the evening. It's a fairly routine 4 hour shift and during my break I was sitting outside in the back parking lot eating a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and talking to my dad over the cell phone. At the time, he was in the hospital recovering from the removal of a non-cancerous tumor from his leg, sort of like you creepy fox, with the tumor you had in your knee. Anyway, from the corner of my eye, I was able to make out a tall figure walking up to me ever so slowly. My attention is on my food, and at first I just assumed it's a customer who is about to pass me, then head to the front of the building. The person stops in place, and before I get a chance to react or say a single word, this individual reaches down and puts his hands over my mouth. He then tells me to shut up and not say a single word as I struggle to get away from him. My cell phone dropped to the floor, bouncing off the concrete ever so slightly, as I can hear my dad asking me what was going on. What was happening was Brian, and he's got a strong hold of me, and he's trying to pull me away from the building. He was strong, but my adrenaline and determination to get away was stronger than he would ever be. Without even thinking, I moved my head just enough to then be able to bite down on his hand so hard that I even tasted blood. He let go in agony as I take a few steps back. Brian no joke pulls out a knife and then tells me I was going to pay for that. You best believe I finally break out of my silence, screaming like a maniac and calling for help, all the while at the same time trying to ensure people would get out of Brian's sudden rageful attack. Thank God that as this happened, a couple of the regulars who just happened to have shown up at that time bumped into me as I turned the corner of the back of the building. I pointed toward Brian, who now stopped in place and stood there in silence. Brian put the knife back into his pocket, just as the two regulars were about to head over to beat the living you-know-what out of him. They didn't, as Brian just ended up running away, but this didn't mean we didn't immediately call the cops. While the cops failed to locate him that night, I did learn a day later he was arrested Brian wasn't as innocent as he made himself out to be, as it was further relayed to me that he had quite the criminal background. You see, during the time that I didn't see him, I guess he was serving some jail time, which explained why things had gone silent with him. It's just scary to think that he never forgot about me during that time period, and he must have been planning to try and grab me when I least expected it, hiding in the shadows and learning of my break schedule as well as how I'd like to hang out in that one spot every time I was on break. This did affect me a lot, and I had to seek therapy due to how traumatizing the whole incident was. I would continue to work there for another few months, before I eventually put in my two weeks, and I left. It's been many years since this incident. I live in another state across the country, and I'm currently engaged, and I'm so much happier with life than I was months after what happened. Just like I mentioned at the start, please, when you notice someone acting creepy and you feel uncomfortable, you need to speak up. The last thing you need is to end up like me.